is the classroom. Text is here. Can we move a little more this side? Um, is that enough? Is that it's okay? It's good. It's good. good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They um, live stream the Advaita Academy. People always don't like the side angle. They keep saying, have it more in front. But you know, if it is on the side, then I will move my chair if that's it. Mm, it's not really good just when you're looking there. Uh -huh. Oh, that's good. That's very good. But you're now not really in the picture. <laughs> there we go. Mm -hmm. Detail. Yeah, Detail. Details. Details. That's very nice. Yeah, so that camera need not be moved at all. <laughs> Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Unatu Sahadevyam Karabhavahai Tejasvinavadhi Tamasthama Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Of all the things which are universal, one of the things that stands out, universal about what? Universal about the human condition. One of the things that really stands out is this issue of helplessness. This is a constant theme. You know, like the slightest little thing, one throws up the hands <laughs> in despair. <laughs> despair is helplessness, that's what it is. Nothing other than that. One throws in, you know, throws in the towel, that's an expression. Don't know where it came from. <laughs> yeah. Throws up the hands. And that's a very interesting and a universal expression, throwing up the hands in despair and even a universal action. Because these are the organs of actions, these are the primary organs of actions, karmendriyas, with which you identify as what? The doer, correct? With which one identifies as the doer, these are the organs of action. And when the organs of actions are thrown up <laughs> in an act of surrender, Spontaneous surrender. Nobody wants to surrender. You, you do a survey. Do you want to surrender? What will be the answer? Absolutely not. <laughs> you know? Why do you want to know? That will be another answer. And who should I surrender to you? Certainly not to you. 
you know, that will be the third answer. So nobody wants to surrender. But yet, when we look at the, at the whole world, even before American Sign Language, even before, you know, caveman paintings, cave woman paintings on the walls of the caves, <laughs> even before hieroglyphics and, you know, Devanagari alphabet, before that Brahmi alphabet, before that so many, you know, so many ways of expression. Before everything, probably even the, even the caveman when he came from an unsuccessful day of hunting or gathering or whatever it is they did, he must have also said, you know, <laughs> gone. So this expression of helplessness, you know, which, which, has, which is probably the first sign, <laughs> throw up the hands, that helplessness becomes a, a hallmark of the universal human condition. This is really what it is. And even though one may think that it's only occasionally that I raise my hands, you know, that is occasion enough <laughs> to take a look into this situation. It is occasion enough. Because there is nothing occasional about it. Think about it. Most of the times, you know, the, the, the one is on the brink of helplessness, just on the other side, enough to qualify as functional and sane, picking up from the last night's <laughs> refrain. <laughs> just on this side of sanity, just on this side of helplessness, one is. But other than that, you know, what does it take? Everybody has a threshold, correct? Not just doorways. The doorway to the heart has a big threshold. <laughs> it's like the, the village uh, in India, in the villages, you have the entryway where it is, you know, very low. I think it's uh, some ecological reasons, the way the roof hangs and so that all flying objects, unidentified and identified flying objects don't make it into the house because the doors used to be open. And the door would not lead straight away into the house. Even now in rural areas it's like that. The door leads into a courtyard. And in the courtyard, you know, all kinds of communal activities take place. Brushing of the teeth, the washing of the clothes, <laughs> a place of gathering, a place of gossiping, a place of, you know, all kinds of activities. Some, some areas, a different area of cooking, all in this courtyard. And then you, you cross the courtyard and then you get all the rooms. This is how the structure of the house used to be. And the threshold of the, the entry was a tiny, you know. None of your standard doors that you find in the United States will fit. You can make two and two doors out of one. <laughs> and so when you enter the rural households, the main gateway, you have to bend. You have no other way to enter except through bending. Same thing like, you know, some of the shrines are also like that in India. Vaishno Devi in Kashmir. Big Shakti Pitha a place of, you know, uh, uh, goddess, ab uh, uh, you know, abode. And then it's, you have to, you have to actually go through some kind of a rebirthing process. It's like going through a birth canal. You have to bend, and not just bend, you have to get into a fetus position and then come out into the cave where the shrines reside, the, 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 the goddess resides. And so there is something about this threshold which is, you know, which is something to look into because this helplessness, the threshold of helplessness is, is extremely, you know, extremely present and universally present. And sometimes when one is relaxed, Spontaneously, the threshold gets lower, 
you lower your defenses and one is not so offensive anymore. <laughs> when the defenses are lowered, one is no longer offensive. And then what happens? You have all kinds of abilities at your disposal. You feel that you are in a moment of spontaneous grace where all the querulous, <coughs> you know, voices from within have subsided. They are not to be found at all. <laughs> all those complaints, all those nagging, you know, feelings of loath, self-loath and otherwise have stopped for the time being. And it seems like a spontaneous act of grace because you don't know how you got there. And then no sooner than you think, oh, I think I got it. I think Vedanta has finally paid off. <laughs> Yippee! I'm no longer helpless. Then what happens, you know? Immediately the helplessness revisits. Yeah. Revisits. Obliterating this experience, which is why I keep saying moksha is not an experience. <laughs> It's the nature of the experience and it is you. It is you. And so, so this helplessness seems to, you know, it seems to suspend itself naturally. Although those moments or those periods of suspension seem to be mysteriously coming and going. <laughs> Keeping me in a state of suspense. When does this come? When does this go? But there is one time where it is constant. When is that? Ah, Nidrayam, in sleep, seventh case. And <laughs> Nidrayam, in sleep, for about eight hours, there is no helplessness. There is no, you know, keeping on expressing, throwing up the hands in the air. There is no pain, no fear, no dread, no sorrow and then fewer and far between, further between in the states of waking too, one enjoys this state of non-helplessness where the threshold is not like the Indian households, <laughs> where there is a vast space, where is the space, not there here, a vast inner space that one hrit pundarike in the lotus of the heart, this is the Upanishad's words, not this Upanishad but other Upanishads talk about it, in the lotus space of the heart, in the lo why lotus? Because the lotus does not collect dust, it has certain fine hairs on the surface of both the leaves and the petals that dispels any kind of dust and sludge, even though it grows in the sludge, it is, it retains a certain asangatvam, a purity, a non-involvement with its surroundings. So too, this atma, even though it takes on the body, mind, sense, complex, and takes on a certain attribute called jivatvam, Jivatvam means what? Helplessness. <laughs> That's all it is. That's the definition of jiva. Full of peeves. That's why I call it piva. And so Jivatvam is the one who, who has total helplessness. And, and even though this atma, this pure lotus-like Sat Chit Ananda, whose petals are nothing but Sat Chit Ananda of this lotus of the heart. And even though it takes on this body mind sense complex, so it takes on the as though attribute, it as though takes on the attribute of helplessness and grows in the sludge of samsara, is born into the sludge of samsara. It is pure, retains that, that purity, that non-affectedness. 
So Hrit Pundarikam, the lotus of the heart, you know, there is that inner space which is not away from you, which is never away, which is ever present, which is nothing but you alone. So in sleep it is evident because you are not there. <laughs> this querulous eye, the eye that complains, the eye that that's nagging itself all the time, the eye that, you know, keeps beating itself, self-flagellating eye, <laughs> thankfully goes to sleep. <laughs> so when that this this jiva the one full of peeves is not there. The Hrit Pundarika opens, you know, the lotus opens. And it is in stark contrast to what happens to the, to the quote-unquote real lotus in the transactional world. In the transactional world of the, of the everyday reality, the lotus flower opens in response to the sun. So when the sun rises, as the sun is rising, the petal, the buds are so tight and it slowly opens and around noon it is just completely open. And then as it's four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, it closes back again. But the heart lotus (laughs) is the opposite. (laughs) During the Jagrit Avastha, the waking state, And the more it is like this, tightly wound, bound, the more this expression comes. <laughs> Helplessness. And when you go to sleep, the more relaxed you are as you get to bed, go to sleep. As the wares and cares of the day just keep falling off, and as the twilight signals the, uh, the closeness to the entry into a different reality of sleep, the heart lotus opens <laughs> effortlessly, which teaches us something about this heart lotus. And it's also open in moments of joy, in spontaneous moments where one is not plagued by unmanageable desires. One is not plagued by wanting things that one cannot have. Then also (laughs) the heart lotus is spontaneously open, which teaches us an important, a very important thing about the Hrit Pundarika, the heart lotus. And what is that thing? That it is naturally open, correct? So during the Jagrit Avastha, the waking state, I put in place, I meaning who? Piva. Who is Piva? Jiva. <coughs> yes. I with a series of pet peeves, I plus a series of pet peeves, put into operation, put into place mechanisms for closing this lotus. You know. <coughs> you know, one of the first toys I remember having mm. As a child, I don't know if it's still available and I don't know if other people are familiar with this toy. Actually, it was a lotus. It was a wind-up lotus. And you wound it, it was closed, (laughs) and then you wound it and then it opened up. (laughs) And inside would be some Ganapati or Lakshmi or something. So, and see, in those days they used to make toys which were in keeping with the vision. So when the heart lotus opens, some winding is required, <laughs> rather unwinding, and, <laughs> and inside is Ganapati. <laughs> so the heart lotus inside is already Ganapati sitting, demanding a laddu, and, <laughs> and here you keep saying, where are you? When are you going to give me darshan? Am I condemned and deemed to lead this life of incompleteness, this life of helplessness, and you are always going to, you know, play, what is it called, hide and seek, 
we are just playing hide and seek you show me a little bit of yourself and then when i try to just look and see who you are where you are you are gone correct so the toys would of course those toys will not pass that particular toy which i have in mind which i was which i'm talking about will never pass the safety checks here <laughs> because the lotus was made of metal and it had pointy the petals had pointy edges and the wind up thing was so flimsily attached that it came out so you would have to put a, you know i used my mother's hair pin to afterwards again another dangerous thing yeah so i used the hair pin of the mother to wind it up after that thing fell off and everything was pointy the ganesha or the lakshmi inside was also very pointy so it will not pass the safety checks but the toy the idea is very much in keeping with the vision of what we are going to study so very beautiful to grow up like that you know to have that kind of a toy as one of the first toys it was beautiful so really speaking even though the, the winding seemed like it required effort the opening is effortless so this is the paradox here so if it if the opening is effortless why should i put effort <laughs> why should i put effort it should open automatically again this is an expression of help this is an expression of helplessness and this is an expression of helplessness with ego <laughs> my hands are tied i'm not going to do anything i don't want to do anything why ego because at least in here you are acknowledging that okay i am a useless helpless you know hopeless helpless helpless creature here i am a hopeless helpless helpless creature but too proud to show it <laughs> so i get into the vivekananda position not that vivekananda was so i am vivekananda was helpless but you know this is this is what i do so this is a certain expression of closedness with ahankara that is what it is so here so what is the place of effort at what level is the effort to be applied to overcome this helplessness so if this helpless is this helplessness natural to me is it something that i already am the answer of course is no because as i said this is what one wants to be how do i know that i want to be this because from the past life this whiff of the fragrance of the lotus of the heart it has driven me wild and as a last resort i seek vedanta <laughs> when all else fails <laughs> then i say let me log on even if uh, even though i am in my pajamas which is one of the nice things about taking online classes <laughs> so <laughs> early in the morning <laughs> so even though i'm in my weekend day pajama mode you know let me straighten my thinking thinking should not be like pajamas you know <laughs> yeah all floppy you no know. let me just you know understand this even as a last resort when all else fails one logs on that shows something that shows that this search this quest to overcome the helplessness is inbuilt and i refuse to accept that i am a helpless hopeless being this means what that i am not helpless <coughs> so the helplessness is an imposter an interloper of sorts that layers my waking state with all kinds of problems with all kinds of fears and puts me forever in a calamitous on the brink of calamity you know calamity jane you know <laughs> can be everybody's name and so this is the helplessness that i seek to overcome and at that level of seeking to overcome something that is naturally not even there that doesn't need to be overcome is the place for effort precisely because it really speaking at the absolute level of reality at the paramarthikam sat there is nothing to overcome there is no doer there is no helplessness there is no quest there is no pursuit and there is nothing really no karma 
no dharma, everything, all is well all the time. But unfortunately, that paramarthikam sat is expressed through what? Through the vyavaharika means. <laughs> this body-mind sense complex, which is a walking expression of this paramarthikam. And if it is not understood properly, I mean this this is not this knowledge is not properly assimilated, then the Vyavaharikam, the everyday reality, becomes the Paramarthika, becomes the interloper for that which is absolute. When the relative becomes absolute, then what happens to the absolute? It becomes relative. <laughs> this is what in the Brahma Sutra Adi Shankara calls it Anyonya Adhyasa. A superimposition of sorts where, you know, I, I take myself to be what I am not. I take myself to be what I am not, which is one problem. And then I don't take myself to be what I am. I deny what I am which is another problem. This is what the whole jiva's thing is. It's, 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 it's a story. It's a timeless story of self-betrayal. This is the story of the helpless jiva. Self-betrayal means I repeatedly in not seeking, in not putting the effort where it's needed to understand and assimilate the truth of my own glory, I betray myself. And this is what metaphorically we see in the story of Jesus and Judas. This Judas was the betrayer. And it was prophecies that before, you know, the day would be gone, he would betray three times, you know. Who? Who is Jesus? Jesus was his own self, his own glory. Really. Jesus is not this, you know, mind, body, sense, embodied person. We are not talking of a personality called Jesus. We are talking of the cosmic person, the Purusha. Vasanne vasabhavati asad brahmeti vedachet The one who denies the glory of oneself as Brahman becomes non-existent. The Taitriya Upanishad becomes what? He is as good as non-existent. Because you are denying the truth of yourself, you are denying the source of your own existence. That is the worst form of self-betrayal. And in other words, <clears throat> to not pursue this knowledge is a form of great self-betrayal. Even when one has the means to do so. And what means? We are not talking of riches. We are talking of basic five sense organs <laughs> working. <laughs> Even with some help, we are talking of <coughs> the mind working, also with some help, some ginkgo pills. <laughs> so when the human body is there, the mind is there, the senses are there, and I am not making the effort where it is needed, the effort at the level of the everyday to overcome the helplessness, to see that there is nothing to overcome ultimately. That is where the level of effort is required. Because even though the heart is closed, like that toy I was talking about, and even though it appears closed, even in this supposedly closed heart, Ganapati is still sitting, correct? Yeah. The Lord Bhagavan, Ishvara, the truth, Brahman, is still there. Whether it's closed or open, it doesn't make any difference. If it's open, it's easier for me to see and embrace. Even when it's closed, it is still there. That is the good news, actually. <laughs> so the seeking is as though seeking. The effort is as though effort. And then, of course, the poor Vapakshi who is Purva Pakshi? Huh? The quintessential doubter. Yeah. Don't say eastward flying bird. No. Purva Pakshi is the one who 
puts a doubt. And so the Purva Pakshi becomes active. <laughs> and what does this fellow say? If it's an as though effort, why should I put effort? <laughs> yeah, then my answer is also in the form of a question. Everything is as though, correct? Your breakfast is also as though. Why did you have breakfast? <coughs> And then you are making preparations for an elaborate lunch. Why are you having lunch? Why are you having breakfast? That is also as though. Why are you having children? Why are you going to the movies? And then along with the first kind of Purva Pakshi, the quintessential doubter, the doubter with ego, then you have the, the flip side of the other doubter. Who is the other doubter? The given up doubter. <laughs> if everything is as though, why, what is the use of this effort? What will happen? And this doubter also has a certain way of couching this couch philosophy. <laughs> and this, the couching comes in a very interesting way. It's just so fascinating. And the couching for in the second instance, happens almost, uh, uh, how to put it, it's like uh, if I am supposed to gain this knowledge, voice also changes, becomes kind of weak and resigned. If I am supposed to gain this knowledge, by this time the person has gone into meditation. <laughs> A trance of helplessness. <laughs> it's just a dance of helplessness couched into a trance. If I'm supposed to gain this knowledge, it should come on its own. Correct? It should come on its own. Why should I put the effort? Lazy fellow, that's all. <laughs> Somebody is sitting and teaching, can't even come and sit and listen. This is the, 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 the quintessential inner child, rather inner brat. Everything should happen on its own. And the couching philosophy is like, the call hasn't yet come. You know, as though the guru has no other work except to make phone calls. Ajao! You know? <laughs> Read any story in any tradition. Who goes to who? The student goes to the teacher or the teacher, you know, distributes leaflets and then, you know, <laughs> at the road corner and ga gardeners and gathers students. Who goes to who? Think about it. In any tradition, you know, okay, let's not even look at Vedanta. We look at any tradition. So, so the call hasn't yet come. And sometimes they say, we are not interested in gurus. God will directly speak to me and give me this knowledge. Why bring this guru, this interloper, another interloper? God should spontaneously come and enlighten me. Just like the Lord enlightened Ramana Maharshi. They always give the story of Ramana Maharshi. Don't quote the exception, okay? Yeah. Quote the rule. <laughs> In the rule there is safety. An exception is always there. And for that also we have a rule. Every, every rule has an exception. And in Vedanta you cannot escape. Every exception also has a rule. So what is the rule in the case of the likes of Bhagavan, Ramana Maharshi and other, you know, quote unquote spontaneously mokshified enlightened people. <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah. They either you do the make the effort in this life or you have made the effort in previous lives. That's all it is. It's a question of preparation and the effort. Huh? So if you quote the exception, I will make a rule for it. Yeah. <laughs> And really speaking, this whole this spontaneous enlightenment, apne up, you know, one getting enlightened on one's own without any help is a spoof 
It's a modern spoof. In fact, if you go to Kumbh Mela, which is the largest gathering of all holy people in India, you know, a sea of orange is what you will see. And you go there, and you know, there also it's, it's a lot of fun because you get to be around so many sadhus. And then you have to book a tent in advance, because otherwise there's no place to even, you know, even for one footstep you have to book a footprint in advance. <laughs> It's a fascinating thing. It's like a, a city that spontaneously emerges. Two million people, no problem. Water, food, everything is there. It's just amazing. This culture is amazing. And so you go to Kumbh Mela and you also pitch your own tent and sit down. And you know, it's, it's customary to go visit people, you know. It's kind of like a Victorian England, like during the season. So during the season, everybody would come from their burrows, pun intended, they would <laughs> come out of their holes where they were the, you know, these great, uh, you know, lords and ladies. And they would rent a house or the richer nobility would own a house in the, in the, in the city, in London. And during this summer season, they would all come and gather and it was customary to go visit, you know, a secular Kumbh Mela. <laughs> And they would dress up and then go visit. It was customary to pay visits to the aristocracy, to each other. So here also the sadhus go visiting. And of course, those who are the senior sadhus, the, uh, the junior sadhus go visit, there's a protocol there. But doesn't matter where you are on the rank, if you are a small fry or if you are a big person, doesn't matter. Uh, in the visitation, other than the namaste and pranams and the greetings that are exchanged, there is a very important question that is asked. Nobody says, what is your name? They don't care about your name at all. They could be less concerned about your name. You can have a fancy name, Swatma Vidyananda, you can have a very fancy name. <laughs> they don't care about it. You can have the name that is hard to pronounce. They don't care about all that. They say, Aapka Guru Sthan kaha hai? Who is your teacher? What is your lineage? And if somebody has the temerity to go to this august gathering and say, I gained this knowledge, apne aap, you know, I got it all just by myself. So, no, suddenly that person will find that they have no visitors. Yes? This is the the, the respect given to the lineage and to the teachings and to the teacher. Because without that there is no knowledge. And the knowledge has to come through a medium. And I don't understand this, for every other thing one, one has a guru, one has a cooking guru, one has a dance guru, one has a music guru. And then if you don't have either of these three gurus, there is always the life guru, called life coach. There is a life guru. I found out to my dismay and then I asked, I know one life coach actually, yeah. And don't ask me for the email address because that person is not taking on new clients. And <laughs> so what does the life coach do? Helps you to lead life, life guru. Someone for a large fee that you can retain. And then you call up, should I wear blue or green? I'm having troubles with the in-laws. I'm having difficulties. Someone who you can talk and use as a sounding board, someone who is always available whenever you are helpless, <laughs> to keep on the theme of helplessness. And, and therefore, there's something to this. In the sense that the life guru teaches you what to do and how to do this and is available. Of course, a monthly retainer fee is, is, is expected, a large one at that. Because to be available at all times is not, I mean that life guru also has a life, correct? <laughs> and one day what happened to this life guru? 
is that the life guru started to need another life guru. <laughs> ah. Because the, 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 the so-called clients became so much. And that's when the life guru came to me. This is what happened. And so anyhow, this is something. So for everything one does not hesitate to take help, to go to classes, to, you know, even for dance guru, cha-cha-cha, you have to, you know, go to dance class, ballroom dancing, it's a, you know, and there will be a dance guru there. Nobody has any qualms. But when it comes to this particular as though effort to be made, to learn how to do that, immediately one breaks into hives. Guru allergy. This is what it is. Immediately. The stance starts to sing. Helpless, all right, but I can do this myself. <laughs> like a small child who is who is defiant, defiant that I want to tie my own shoes, not even as long as the shoelace, but I want to tie my own <laughs> shoes. Mm -hmm. Refusal to seek help when one is helpless is a sign of dull intelligence. Really, what else can you say? It may sound harsh to hear, but it is the truth. Help is there, it is available. And helplessness is also available, <laughs> right at my fingertips. But I will not help myself. This is another sign of self-betrayal. This is where the ahankara, the ego forcefully puts a block. And so here, enter the lineage. In the lineage of teaching, and what is this teaching? The teaching to overcome this universal helplessness by revealing the truth of oneself as totally free of helplessness. This is the teaching. And this teaching is something which is extremely wonderful, extremely beautiful and it is it is backed by the entire lineage. It is safe. When you see the lineage, there is a sense of safety. When you see apne aap, apne aap means what? Gain the knowledge all by oneself. There is danger. Because you don't know what that person got. And what that person is going to teach. <laughs> you don't know. So if anybody says, I got the knowledge all by myself, just say, keep it also all to yourself. <laughs> Don't give to me. That's all you have to say. Enjoy it. Be blessed, enjoy it. Good that you got the knowledge all by yourself. I would rather seek a trustworthy lineage where there is no possibility of going wrong. When you talk of, you're not talking of, you know, guru, great guru, grand guru. We're not talking of just that. We're talking of an endless lineage. Sadashiva Samarambham, Shankaracharya Madhyamam, Asmadacharya Paryantam, Vande Guru Paramparam. I salute the entire lineage, Parampara. Guru Parampara. I salute the lineage of teachers, which began with what? Who is the first Guru? Bhagavan. Who else? How do you know Bhagavan is the first Guru? Where is the proof? <laughs> huh? How do you know? Bhagavan is the first guru. Who told you? For that person you say, who is the first mother? You ask. Was there a first mother? Uh, don't think so hard. If you are there, definitely <laughs> there, is the, there, is, there was a mother. There was the first mother. Who is Adi mother? That person is also Adi guru. <laughs> So that which came from Bhagavan, here uh, it's a, uh, Shiva is eulogized. But if you say, now I am not into Shiva, then we have another way to trace the lineage. Narayanam, we have from Narayana, from Vishnu, doesn't matter. I am not into Vishnu either. Then okay, there is a Shakta lineage, you trace it through the goddess, no problem. 
no problem at all when that guru is called hayagriva the one who teaches about the goddess haya means what horse griva neck face so this teacher had the face of the horse and taught about the same knowledge what, what other things can you teach really <laughs> what else is there to teach and so people following that particular tradition can say i got it from the horse's mouth <laughs> 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 so so we have all kinds of origins but the origin is really one it comes from that truth from bhagavan from ishvara from the co- the cosmic person from that truth which is myself really from brahman alone shankaracharya madhyama and shankaracharya about whom we know a lot whose life story an exalted teacher in the lineage is mentioned so the one who's the, the the lineage that began from the most exalted source and was carried on through the exalted teachers like adi shankara and before him vyasa asmad acharya paryanta and which ends where which ends at the feet of my own teacher i salute the entire lineage see the beauty of this prayer see the force of this see the truth in this and the beauty of this is just in the fact that nobody in the last 5000 years was misled following this path that is the beauty of it so therefore there is safety already helplessness means there is a puk puk inside what is that puk puk chicken hearted oh my god helpless <laughs> insecure afraid puk 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 and for that puk puk the one that does the shanti to that puk puk <laughs> is this is this beautiful prayer is this beautiful vision behind this prayer and what is that vision the vision is that all that is here is this one truth that has been communicated lagatar means without a break for the last 10000 years 5000 years i mean after 5000 you stop counting it's been communicated communicated how successfully how do you know it was successful <laughs> <laughs> this means purva pakshi okay yeah. <laughs> how do you know it was successful <laughs> person sits up straight also at that time <laughs> yeah the other one is a sloucher you know this one is yeah how do you know it was successful because you are here okay yeah because you are here how do you know i am here well if you <laughs> ask that question <laughs> to that question only you have the answer as we saw last night i don't have the answer how come you are here you have to ask that you have to answer that you are here and you know you are here i know you are here because you know you are here okay and so so this it's a very safe thing to know that i can gain this knowledge and what is this knowledge that as though effort which really is effortless <laughs> which is required to let go of all these closures and these sources that close up the heart lotus satchidananda petaled heart lotus so that i can have darshan of the truth of myself so all that is required in this as though effort is supplied through the teaching the vision is supplied through the teaching and what is the vision we saw last night briefly tat tvam asi you are that which you seek you are the cause of the universe you are satchit ananda you are ishvara you are brahman you are the whole you are not helpless hopeless hapless you are free of sorrow fear dread despair you are free of all the things that you seek to be free from you are free in short of samsara this is the vision 
So the vision is given in through the lineage, through the grace of the lineage, the vision comes. And through the same grace of the lineage, how to assimilate this vision? Because it sounds very nice to hear. And that's what led Shweta Ketu in the Tattvamasi story. When he heard from his father Uddalaka, he heard the teaching. And he heard that all that is here is one Sat and use Shweta Ketu. Tat Sat Sa Atma Tvamasi Shweta Ketu. He heard. And all that you have to know in this Jagat, in this world, is that one Sat alone. Just like Ekena Mritpindena Sarvam Mrinmayam Vignatam Iva Bhavati. When you know one lump of clay, the entire clay world of pot inside another, yeah, this pot has been swallowed, and the one inside, yeah. Pot inside another pot, inside another pot is all understood. And even if the pot is glazed, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> it is still understood as being nothing but clay. Same thing when the jiva walks with a glaze over the eyes, it's still Brahman. (laughs) That was nice, no? Yeah. (laughs) So the dazed, glazed jiva, also Brahman. So the glazed pot, also clay. And Shweta Ketu heard this and and wanted to hear it again. Bhūya eva bhagavan vijyāpayatu. Tell me again, tell me again, tell me again, tell me again. This is the grace of the lineage. When you hear it, it sounds wonderful. But then it's almost gone. It's like I got a, when I sit in the class, everything is crystal clear. <laughs> when I leave the class, the knowledge also seems to leave. <laughs> that is why this repetition, vipsa. The repetition is also part of the teaching, not like a parrot, you know. And not like, you know, when you go, on, uh, I travel a lot and so I'm in many airports. And all the airports have one thing in common, two things. <laughs> one thing is that always my gate will be the furthest. <laughs> my karma is like that, you know. In half an hour I have to travel, you know, from one, from A to F in every airport. That is, that is my personal truth. And then in order to make this journey, there will be these moving walkways, correct? Yeah. And this is the main thing that all the airports have in common. It's an automated voice. What does it say? Moving walkway is now ending. 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 The teaching is not a repetition like that. (laughs) That kind of a repetition will not get you anywhere except to the threshold of boredom. Yeah. (laughs) Where you will make a new resolve. I will not attend any more Vedanta classes. This knowledge called Vedanta is dynamic. It is, it is fantastic. It is dynamic. It's always unfolding the same thing in a new way because that self which is free of name and form and which is glorious in itself, it's, it's the source of endless glory. And that endless glory, all the words of the world surrender to that endless glory and describe that endless glory endlessly, it still doesn't come to an end. Mm -hmm. That is really what limitlessness is about. So the same knowledge is expressed through different teachings, different Upanishads, and through the same Upanishad also, differently. It's always in the moment, in the moment, in the moment, it is fresh, it is whole, it is full, it is free, it it is grand, it is glorious, it is gorgeous in the moment. And then in the next moment, it's equally grand, equally glorious, equally gorgeous, beautiful. And this is the blessing of the lineage, to be able to see this glory endlessly uh, 
without and it is a repetition but not really a repetition it is a it's not a redundant repetition and the repetition is allowed in teaching it's not allowed in other things but the teaching the repetition has to be allowed but it's a repetition in a new way a restatement in a new way of that endless glory this is the 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 blessing of the lineage that one gets then there is one more blessing that how to internalize this knowledge how to make this effort successful because if there are certain gaps holes in the understanding sometimes the holes are bigger than the grand canyon <laughs> a lot to bridge you know even hanuman ji has to think twice before jumping yeah <laughs> hanuman ji you know did not think it is said otherwise he wouldn't have jumped from rameshwaram to jaffna he jumped yeah from from the tip of india to sri lanka he jumped because there was a sabha of these vanaras vanara doesn't mean monkey naro va nava iti shanka <laughs> are they humans or not this was the doubt so come some kind of a humanoid tribe and and there was some old vanaras who sat there and said we are too old we cannot jump and there were some young ones who were not ready to sacrifice themselves into the arabian sea this this whole bay of you know bengal the indian ocean which is very uh, you know ruthless when it comes to gobbling up jeevas <laughs> and hanuman ji it is said just looked at the span and said i will do it he didn't say i can he didn't even know if he could he said i will do it so to the grace of the lineage <laughs> and like the jump of hanuman ji enables to to go to 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 bridge these gaps in one's understandings beautifully and there are so many gaps and the gaps are all what got left out in one's past the gaps in the nurturing the gaps in the love the gaps in the attention the gaps in between moments of presence and absence of the caregivers and those gaps morph and calcify into certain insurmountable fears blocks resistances and that calcification is is you know thought out sometimes it has to be operated <laughs> because it's beyond thawing out <laughs> Yesterday I read in the news that this 92-year-old woman, 92, okay, ga, yeah, was operated successfully because they found in the X-ray because she was complaining of stomach pains, and the 92-year-old was successfully operated out of a, a fetus that was inside her that was 40 years old, a dead one, and over which a calcification had developed. you see yeah and then she was operated of that it is called a stone baby apparently lithopedian is the is the is the is the scientific name for it and so the baby died of course but she didn't even know she was pregnant i suppose and then you cannot have a dead baby inside because the, the it's a cause of sepsis and infection so the body which is so intelligent releases this excess calcium and coats this whole body of the fetus so that it doesn't harm the person and so she carried it till age 92 <laughs> without any problems then she's com- complaining of stomach pains the lineage is like that the grace of the lineage is like that that all the ca- the calcified inner child like this fetus all the hurts and pains over which this god given unconscious puts a cover that's why it's called unconscious puts a calcified thing so that it doesn't harm the growing baby it doesn't harm the person and the person grows up to be somewhat functional mostly helpless but covering that up <laughs> and then what happens then a day comes where 
this operation has to take place, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ajnana timirandhasya Jnana anjana shalakaya Chakshurun militai yena Tasmai shri gurave namaha Salutations unto that teacher who successfully performs operations every day. What? Are you talking of the doctor or a teacher? The teacher is a doctor of sorts. He is a surgeon. Yes. And the surgeon performs two things. You know, First is anesthetizes the patient. Because you don't want the patient to be squawking in the middle of the operation. Is that the right size scalpel that you are using? Are you cutting in the correct place? You don't want this fellow, you know, you don't want the input from this fellow, correct? So the surgeon has to anesthetize the patient and then perform what is called the surgery, right? Yeah. And so therefore what? So this anesthesia is part of the grace of the lineage. (laughs) Where the ahankara in the process of the teaching, you know, does not trouble one. Yeah. The ahankara is suspended as the grace of the lineage, the grace of all the gurus, the grace of our own guru, the grace of Bhagavan. The ahankara is suspended enough to be able to see the truth of ourselves in and through the little crevices in the beginning. <laughs> A small aperture opens up to see, oh, maybe I'm not this, maybe I'm not this, maybe I'm not this. Ha! Ma! This is the knowledge, this is the grace of the lineage. So it helps to overcome this calcification of the past, the fear of the unconscious, all the past fears that have calcified into this stone-like block. It helps to just break up. So salutations unto that Guru and to the lineage, which performs the surgery. What is this surgery? Through the scalpel of knowledge, Jnananjana Shalakaya removes the cataract of my vision, which makes me see properly that which was already there. This is the beauty of and the grace of the lineage, and this is the importance of the lineage in overcoming the helplessness. How, why? More we will see after the break. Just 15 minutes, okay? Just get up, stretch, do what you have to do. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Gurubhyo Namaha Harihi Om Yeah, that can be closed and a new 